Greetings, and welcome to the Black Flame Podcast, where history and legends collide, where cryptids, the supernatural, and the paranormal run free. We are your hosts, Dan and John Leonard, and we are here to bring you stories of haunted places, creepy cryptids, and harrowing legends. So sit back and let us guide you through the world of the unexplained. This week, we'll only be covering one story because of time constraints, but we assure you, this one's mysterious enough to count for two. So without further ado, here is the Villisca Axe Murder House. Rural America is littered with small towns. Most of them go unnoticed to those who don't live in or around them, but some, as small as they might be, are known around the country. Most famous small towns earn their name on the map from their charm, idyllic landscapes, and friendly atmosphere. Some of them, though, are known by many for much darker reasons, and the town of Villisca, Iowa, is a prime example of this. Its claim to fame rests in a small, unassuming, two-story home that served as the backdrop for a crime so heinous and mysterious that people still talk about it to this day. And if the legends are true, the living aren't the only ones still talking about what took place in the Villisca Axe murder house. The year is 1912, and the heat of the sweltering June sun is starting to break as it heads towards the horizon, giving way to a cool summer night. The Moore family has been attending a service at the local Presbyterian church and are finally walking home to get a good night's rest. Respected businessman Josiah Moore, his wife Sarah, and their four young children, Herman, Mary, Arthur, and Paul, were accompanied by two of the kids' friends, Lena and Ina Stillinger, who were planning to spend the night with the Moores. They left the church around 9.30 p.m. and arrived at their home sometime between 9.45 and 10 o'clock. Eventually, they made their way to their rooms for some much-needed sleep. The following morning, a neighbor by the name of Mary Peckham noticed that no one had been moving in or outside of the Moore residence by 7 a.m., so she decided to investigate. After letting the Moore's chickens out of their coop, she approached the front door and began knocking, but no response came. She tried the door anyway, but it was locked. Fearing something might be wrong, she fetched Josiah's brother, Ross, to see if he could get to the bottom of it. After his knocking and shouting got no return, he used his copy of the house key to let himself in. What he found inside would leave its mark on the town forever. At first it seemed as though nothing was out of the ordinary, but as he swung the guest room door open, that notion quickly left. Lying under the sheets on the bed were the bludgeoned bodies of Lena and Ina Stillinger. Ross was appalled. He ran out of the house and called to alert the police. During their walkthrough, they found that everyone in the house had been brutally murdered in the dark of night, with all eight people receiving blows to the head with Josiah's own axe. Shortly after the police made their initial walkthrough and gathered as much evidence as they could, a mob of spectators began flooding the home inside and out for their chance to get a look at the crime scene. The police tried to keep them out, but they just kept coming in, trampling all over the house and disturbing possible clues. As frustrated as they were, the authorities believed they had enough information to put together some kind of picture of how the murders took place. With doctors placing the murders sometime between midnight and 5 a.m., the police believed that the murderer attacked the parents, Josiah and Sarah, first, as they were the biggest threat. From there, he went on to murder the Moore children one by one, before finishing with the Stillinger sisters downstairs. All of the victims were found lying in position under the sheets, as if the murderer had pulled them up over their heads before striking. It appears they all most likely slept through the killings, except for 12-year-old Lena Stillinger. She was found lying on her stomach crossways on the bed, with defense wounds on her arms and legs, leaving authorities to believe she had been awake and fought back prior to her murder. 
as if the grisly nature of these slangs wasn't enough. Some odd details began emerging upon further inspection. When detailing the fatal wounds to each victim, it became clear that the sharp end of the axe was only used on Josiah, while the rest of them were killed with the blunt side. Josiah also received considerably more damage than the others, with an estimated 30 to 40 blows from the axe to his face and head. So much so that they couldn't identify most pieces of his face with his eyeballs marked as missing. At the time, they believed he gave his initial blows to Josiah and Sarah, slayed the children, and then returned to do more damage to the lifeless corpses of Josiah and Sarah. The position of Lena Stillinger's body led to further speculation as well. They found her underwear under the bed, and her nightgown pulled up over her waist as if she may have been molested, either before or after she was killed. As they were walking through the house, the police also noticed some other odd things out of place. All the shades were pulled down, and the mirrors in every room were covered with sheets and clothing. In the kitchen, they found a partially eaten meal, and a bowl of bloody water most likely used to clean the murderer's hands and weapon. And sitting on the floor, next to the axe found in the guest room, was a pound of bacon wrapped in parchment. The investigators also found two smoked cigarettes in the attic of the home. It is believed that this is where the killer waited while the Moore family made their way home and into bed before carrying out the murders while they slept. Even with all of these strange clues, the authorities were still left with more bewilderment than hard evidence that pointed to one particular suspect, but that didn't stop them from making numerous accusations. In wake of the investigation, ensuing panic, and media frenzy, multiple people were accused of being the murderer. From a transient worker to a repeat violent offender, it seemed there were multiple people who may have fit the bill for possible suspects, but two of the accused tend to stick out more than the rest. Reverend George Kelly was described as an odd character who was later diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. He was also accused of being a peeping Tom and asking young women to pose nude for him. He also happened to be the minister who presided over the Children's Day service on June 8th, the day before the Moore family attended. The Reverend supposedly left Villisca around 5 to 5.30 a.m. on June 10th, just hours before the bodies were found raising suspicions that he may have had something to do with the murders. After being apprehended by the police, he claimed to know details about the crime and said he heard the sounds of them being murdered and something moving around within the house. Because of his known disabilities, authorities didn't feel they could trust his confession. They also added that they doubted a man of his diminutive size would even have the strength to wield the axe in a way that's consistent with the devastating result of the crimes. Some do speculate, however, that given his history of window peeping, he may have actually been there while the murders were going on, if his account of hearing noises is true. Another interesting prospective suspect is a man named Frank Jones. Josiah worked at Frank's implement store for a long time before leaving to open his own business, taking many of Frank's clients with him, which led to a considerable loss of income. There were also rumors that Josiah was having an affair with Frank's daughter, and even though those rumors haven't been substantiated, it's easy to make the connection to a possible motive given how wronged Frank must have felt by him. Another likely theory is that the killer wasn't a regular in the town of Villisca, but a serial killer who traveled across the country by train. Villisca happens to rest alongside a set of railroad tracks that run across the country, and it turns out that a man named William Blackie Mansfield had been accused of other similar murders in other states but it seems he had an airtight alibi and was released by the court. Years later, though, this theory would come back into play, only with a different murderer behind the axe. You see, there were a string of axe slayings that occurred along this railroad track across multiple states that contained chilling similarities to the Velisca murders, with the covering of the mirrors, possible molestation, using the blunt side of an axe, and even right down to the suspected time of murder. It all began with a manhunt for the only suspect of a murder in Massachusetts, named Paul Mueller. The police never caught him, but in their book, The Man from the Train, Bill James and Rachel McCarthy were able to possibly link him to a string of 14 incidents with consistent M.O.s 
and over 59 dead. Many think he is most likely responsible, but until more information surfaces, we may never know for sure just who the cold-blooded monster was. That is, unless we get some answers out of those who were slain in the Moore House. Thanks to historical preservation, the Velisca Axe Murder House is still standing to this day, and according to those who have visited, such conversations with the deceased victims are all too possible. With over 40 paranormal investigative teams having headed investigations there, this little house has had more than its fair share of opportunities to speak its truth, and whether or not you think they're legit, you can find some of the clearest disembodied voices and EVPs you'll ever hear. From children saying mama, to voices calling out investigators by name, this has to be one of the most EVP-heavy hotspots in the country. Disembodied voices aren't the only reported activities that go on in the house, though. Many guests who stay at the house have brought toys for the children to play with, and some claim that they've even seen them move around, or have them disappear after leaving the room and returning later. The caretaker and tour guide, Johnny Hauser, had a pretty chilling encounter himself. He claims that one day he was upstairs cleaning when he heard someone enter the house, which was supposed to be locked. No one was supposed to be in there, so he assumed someone snuck in to get a look at the place. He heard them approaching the stairs, so he thought he'd play a little prank on them to teach them a lesson for breaking in. He hid in the closet of an upstairs bedroom and waited, listening to the footsteps ascend the stairs. When they reached the top, he kicked the door open and yelled, but when he jumped out, no one was there. He checked the security footage, and no one was inside the house the entire time except for him. This had to be puzzling to say the least, but some encounters are downright freaky. A family of three was once exploring the second floor alone during a daytime tour. At one point, the three-year-old daughter came pouting over to her parents. When they asked what was wrong, she said, those kids are weird. When the parents asked what kids she was talking about, she said, the ones under the bed, they won't come play with me. The parents said they told her to leave them under the bed and shook off the chill in their spine. Our final encounter happened in 2014, and it was so impactful that it made for an internet sensation. A man in his 50s was slated to stay at the house overnight with his elderly parents. When Mr. Hauser was through with their tour, he handed the keys over to the man and told him to have a nice stay. The man then told him that he was going to give the spirits a piece of his mind. While his parents were gone, the man was investigating the room where Lena and Ina Stillinger were killed. When they returned, they found their son in a pool of blood on the floor and his hunting knife sticking out of his chest. Paramedics were called, and he was airlifted to the hospital where he made a full recovery. A few years later, the paranormal investigative show Kindred Spirits were doing an episode on the Velisca murder house, and they convinced the man to return to the house, and that's where his side of the story came out. The man was supposedly investigating, and he remembers provoking the spirits, telling them to come at him. And then the next thing he knows, he's waking up in a hospital bed in Omaha, the caretaker says he hasn't stayed overnight in that house since that incident, and he doesn't like to be alone in there anymore. Perhaps the man stabbed himself. But also, maybe, just maybe, the axe murderer isn't quite done killing just yet. Poking a hole in your story. Do what? You're poking a hole in your story. How? You said perhaps the axe murderer isn't done killing yet? He is. That was with a knife that wasn't an axe. Come on. <laughs> you get what I meant. <laughs> I never heard of this place. It's, uh, it's, I mean, it's in a small town, Villisca. And I think the first place I heard about it was on, like, it was on America's Most Terrifying Places or something like that. There's also a lore episode about it um, that's really good. So they've, it's been investigated a lot, and some of the things that you hear, some of the uh, EVPs that come up are just crazy. I couldn't believe it when I was digging through it all. Like, just super clear audio. Like, usually, you know, it's it's kind of like, 
oh my god, it sounds like a whisper. And it's like, well, it could just be noise, you know, like white noise in the background that shifts and whatever, some kind of weird uh, affect. But it's like these sound like you and me talking. It's really kind of crazy. Hmm. Yeah, that one story was freaky about the guy who, the staff member who was there alone. He said he was going to play a prank on him. Yeah. And then hit in there and listen to footsteps come yeah. up to the room. Yep. And check the cameras and no one was there. Just crazy. I think I'd have to quit. <laughs> well, that's the thing. So the guy, I watched an interview with him too. Um, and it's, it's a really, it's a really small house. Like, so there's the downstairs. I forget how, what the, what the square footage was, but you walk in and there's like a, there's the kitchen, the parlor. It's like very, you know, it's like a square house and you walk up the steps and you're immediately in Josiah and Sarah's bedroom. And like there's, you just walk right up the steps and there it is. Mm. And then the next room over is where the, uh, the boys room was. Um, and then downstairs was where the girls slept. And that's that night, Lena and Ina Stillinger were staying in there. So that's why they weren't down there. But, um, it's, it's a, and the attic of the house is actually kind of like we have here where it's, it's, just, it's not above the rest of the house. Yeah. It's just a room that's next to the other rooms with a door that, where they just store stuff. Huh. So it's not your typical, what you would think of as an attic, but, yeah. um, used in the same way, I guess the whole, the whole mystery surrounding the entire thing. They, they had no idea who did it. They obviously had a lot of people accused of doing it. But the the fact that to this day we still aren't hundred percent sure, we probably will never know. Yeah, I mean how will how could you? Unless you can really track down, you know, certain movements of people back then, but even then you can't put a stamp on anything. No. And unfortunately they didn't have DNA evidence back in nineteen twelve. No. So it's just the pervasive nature of the mystery. I think is what's so interesting. On if it wasn't for the the mystery, the hauntings alone are kind of crazy to talk about and I'm sure to witness. But the fact that it's still unsolved just adds another layer to this whole story that's seems like it's still ongoing almost. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's kind of like the um town that they're Town that dreaded sundown. Yeah. The Texarkana killer. Yep. I thought about that when yeah. I was writing this Because they never found him. No. They have no idea who that guy was. They yeah. had multiple people accused, but... Yeah. Yeah. And there's something about that where it's it feels like it's still a thing, you know? I mean, it kind of is. I guess still so. still technically an open investigation. A cold case. Yeah. But... And they, they said that, like, the mob of people that... It just sounded kind of crazy. Because, like, you can picture it's a small town in the middle of nowhere where nothing ever really happens. And then you have this murder. And then all of a sudden, everybody shows up. Everybody from town. As soon as, I think it was one of the uh, doctors who went back into town to get something, had mentioned it to a store clerk or something. And then it just kind of exploded from there and everybody found out. And they all showed up there and they were like taking things from the scene. And like, it was just chaos inside the house while the police were trying to conduct an investigation. Well, people were scared. Yeah. You know. People well, and, freaked out. And they, you know, that's the biggest thing that's ever happened to that town up at, until that point. I mean, that's probably. huge. Yeah. Eight people dead? Eight people. With an axe? Yep. It's kind of weird, man. It's crazy. And it's, I mean, back then there were actually a lot of murders by axe. And if you think about it. Eight people? Eight people's a lot. In a small house? All of them were asleep except one that supposedly woke up. Right. And that's where they think that whoever was wielding the axe must have had a lot of experience with it to be able to... to be accurate enough to hit one blow. And take them out. Yeah. Right. And that's what they were talking about because, like I say, they were all found under their sheets. And it looked as if I read that they were underneath the sheets when they got hit, which is an odd way to sleep. You know, with your sheets pulled completely up over your face. They might not mean, like, over their face. They might just mean, like, in a sleeping position underneath the sheets. Well, that's what I read was it appeared as though he pulled it up over their heads, which mm. is kind of weird. And actually, in the house, there's a spot in Josiah and Sarah's room where there's a gouge in the wall 
up behind because like it's a, it's got a peaked ceiling to it yeah because it's the top of the house and it's peaked like this and so when the the killer was perpendicular to the peak and swung mm-hmm. that axe up and it gouged part oh. of the ceiling out when he came down so like on the upswing he smacked the ceiling and came down and still didn't wake the other ones up and i imagine when he probably hit josiah first probably and that's what i would assume and so that means he had to have smacked him first then immediately gone and hit sarah yeah because i mean it's got to make noise when you hit someone in the head with an axe well and you're laying in bed next to somebody who gets hit in the head with something like that you're gonna feel it i would think but the fact that he hit him with the front side, the sharp edge, and then flipped it around real quick and hit her with the back end. Seems crazy. Yeah. And being that there were, he kind of went back and did more damage to them after the fact, could also have screwed some things up, or maybe he hit both of them with the sharp side, and there was just too much devastation to tell. Yeah. But just such a cold-blooded act. It's It's no wonder that this place would be haunted like that. And I almost wonder if them not knowing who did it has something to do with why it is so haunted. Probably. But probably that's just a lot of negative energy, too. Yeah. Also. Right. A lot of suffering. It's such a crazy thing. It's upsetting to read, honestly, when it's when you really get into the details. Yeah, it's like Amityville Horror. It's yeah. just like Amityville Horror. That one also gets me, too, because he wasn't using... He was using, he was using a, gun, a gun. And they all... We're asleep pretty what much in the that, same seven, position. Eight people? That was uh seven people? I think it was it was the two parents, two parents and I think three or four kids. Three kids. So seven. No. Right? Cuz it was That'd be like five. Oh yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> math. I'm trying to think it was the parents, a young the youngest girl and two brothers. Yeah, I yeah. think it was five. Mhm. I think that's right. Five or six. But for that to for them not to wake up to gunshots inside of a house. That's weird. And now, I just watched something about that, too. The shock doc that they have about that. Um, and it's not a... The gun he used was a... It was a repeating arm, wasn't it? It was a, it was a Marlin... Um, not twenty two. 14 caliber? 20, 26. It was a weird caliber, but it was small. So... Now, I would still think that even if he was doing it with a twenty two, you know how loud those are. They're not super They're, loud. Tsh, you know, but inside a, of a house. A crack. Yeah. yeah. But inside of a house. Yeah. You're going to hear that, I would assume. Yeah. So that one kind of baffles me more as far as how do you do that. Now, the Velisca axe murder, he, you know, obviously an axe is a lot quieter. For, so someone in the next room might not really wake up to dull thuds. Yeah. But... And the, the fact that he was as skilled as he was also lends credence to the idea that this may have been some kind of serial killer. Yeah. And not. It seems like it was thought out. Because he had a, a half-eaten meal there and a bowl and cigarettes in the attic. So he was waiting. So it seemed like it was, you know. Oh, it was pretty, definitely premeditated. Yeah, pretty thought out. I think that's for sure. But the... And the, the covering of all the mirrors and windows is a it's kind of creepy to think about, but I think from a psychological aspect, it's like you don't want to face yourself, you know, after doing something so crazy. Well, I can see the windows. Yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> but the the mirrors, every mirror, every reflective surface is what some of the reports said hmm. were covered up, and some people say that there's some kind of uh, superstition i think that if you do something bad and you see your reflection that something bad will happen to you i forget what the superstition is but Hmm. some people say it could be that or psychologists have said you know it's more just they don't want to face who they really are in the mirror kind of quite literally yeah you know after doing such a horrendous thing but or it could just be something just to make people kind of throw people off trail a little bit yeah you know yeah because some some most serial killers are very smart people believe it or not they're very smart most of them and yeah but why it would kind of shock i don't know 
But it's just something else to get your mind wrapped around instead of getting wrapped around another important fact. You know, that could be. I guess. That could be. I don't know. But then the fact that they they were other there were other slayings with, you know, mirrors covered up and done with an axe and you had the possible molestation case in some of them, not all of them. Yeah. But it just lines up so perfectly. And all along the railroad system that I tend to believe it must have been someone hopping the train or even a railroad worker maybe who, you know, had a stopover for the night, hopped off and would go do his thing and get back on the train for the morning. I mean, if he did, he would have to stay out somewhere and watch for a couple nights because he can't just go walking in the house, find an axe, just sit in the, you know, most likely he didn't do that. Well, you know, just pick a random family. Oh, I'm just going to go in this little house. And then he, you know, finds well, I mean, out, he, crap, there's like eight people here. I got some work to do tonight. You know, that whole deal. I mean, he could have staked it out for a day. He doesn't have to, you know, it is what it is. It doesn't have to be a, someone hopping off the train, getting back on the next day. But it, um, all I'm saying is I think there's a definite connection between all those different murders and the railroad tracks. And the weird thing about the Reverend, how he said he heard stuff happening yeah. never did anything and so it doesn't alarm you well that's the thing he he wasn't all there that's true and too he you know the people in town treated him as such and totally thought that he could have done it at first and then as they got listening to him because he actually confessed to it and then he kind of backed off and said well no i didn't uh, i just heard some things and it was like ah yeah, I don't know if I can quite believe him. Now, his time frame is kind of weird where he left town shortly before the bodies were discovered. Yeah. And they say that the murders were probably carried out sometime between 12 a.m. and uh, five. 5. And he was leaving then. Around 5, he was getting out of town. But they because he had been accused of being a peep in Tom before, they think that he maybe could have actually heard something and, like was Just looking through the window. yeah and because he also knew the family so hmm. he knew they had little girls which he also had been accused of trying to get to pose nude and everything a very sick individual but this little town is quite, it's pretty messed up <laughs> it's kind of crazy and they you know also that he claimed to know things about the crime scene that someone wouldn't normally know but they also had to rule that out because of everybody walking through the house uh, that's true. afterwards. So that also kind of ruined part of their investigation. Yeah. Um, and he actually became obsessed with the case apparently and started writing letters to the police about it and stuff. It was very strange. The guy hmm. was not right in his head. Yeah. And Josiah's former boss, you know, is a, that was a looser theory, and the, the rumor with him having an affair with his daughter was never substantiated, so we can't quite nail him down for it either. And then the uh, Blackie, the Mansfield, yeah. he had been accused of other crimes, and they actually thought that a uh, someone may have hired him, the sen- a local senator may have hired him for, he had some bad dealings with Josiah, apparently, hmm. and... But they're not entirely sure. But apparently Mansfield had, he was on the payroll, like miles away from there, the day of the killings and the day after. So there's almost zero chance that he could have traveled there in time to kill and come back, even though he was accused of doing similar nefarious things. Yeah, and as far as the the hauntings go, the... The one where the guy stabbed himself is a weird one. Uh, yeah. That's a doozy. I don't know what to think about that one. I I don't I haven't seen the guy. I don't I haven't seen any interviews with him, so I don't really know what to think if he's of sound mind or not. I mean, even still, you don't know. Yeah. You know. And he just I don't know. Apparently, the Johnny Hauser, the guy that takes care of the property um talked to him personally and asked him like what the heck happened and uh he was seemed like he was a straight shooter according to him but 
I don't know. That's a that's a weird one. That's a weird one. But it's no more weird than thinking that maybe Ronnie DeFeo had been possessed by something to kill his family in Amityville. A little bit different story, because like we said, he had a gun. He didn't have an axe. Yeah, but still, I mean, the, just the fact that somebody could be taken over by something else and forced to do things they don't necessarily want to do isn't out of the realm of possibility, I think. And so I'm, I, yeah, not, I wouldn't rule anything out, but I do lean towards the side of like, I think that guy probably just stabbed himself. Now, why I have, I don't know. I don't know either. That's very weird. Maybe to get public, um, you know, famous. I Maybe. Could be. That's a heck of a way to do it. Stab yourself in the chest with a hunting knife though. Well, if you look up and know what to do, obviously there's people that know how to, you know, where to stab, where not to kill. And a hunting knife can be a small knife. I don't think this was a small one <laughs> because he, he apparently had this on his hip because he normally carried a gun with him, but he wasn't sure what the laws were like in Iowa when they were visiting. So he brought his hunting knife instead. Now what I assume when he says hunting knife is like a, something you'd skin a deer with, yeah. you know, it's usually something you got to <clears throat> keep in a sheath, especially since he said he kept it on his hip. That tells me it's probably not a small knife. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what to think about that one. It's odd. But no, and the one with the, the little girls under the... Oh, under the bed? Yeah. When the little girl was like, oh, those kids are weird. They won't come play with me. <laughs> that would freak mm. me out. Ugh. That would be so freaky. I don't know what I'd do. I'd, I'd just leave. I'd leave. Yeah. Well, that's like, I love the parents' response and they were like, yeah, they won't come out from under the bed. And they were like, leave them there. <laughs> <laughs> They don't want to come out for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> Leave them. I don't want them out here either. Now, the little girls under the bed, could they be hiding from some kind of dark spirit that may have stabbed that guy? That could be too. You know, they could just be completely terrified of anybody that walks into the house because the last time they were too. alive, the, someone came in there they didn't know killed them. Yeah. But. Or do they even know they're dead? Yeah, they, they might not. Playing. Right. And that's the thing. I, I would assume that if they were hiding under the bed, it wouldn't be a residual haunting. I think that's more of an intelligent thing. Yeah. But. Because if it were residual, you'd walk in and see a dead body laying in your bed. Yeah. <laughs> be freaky. Yeah. But I don't know. I wonder if that's ever happened. If anyone's ever experienced that, I just know. walked in and saw like a dead body laying in the bed. And left and came back and it was just gone. Yeah. That would I wonder be if that's ever happened. I'm sure you can find it somewhere. Or like a dead body on the floor or something. Yeah. It would freak me out. Or like someone falling down a window, like looking out the window and someone falls out the window or something. I think I've heard of something. Oh, now that where. would be a freaky one. You I look th- out and there's no one there. I think I've heard of an account somewhere of somebody actually saying it looked like somebody fell past the window. Boy, that'd be a bad feeling. Oh, boy, that'd be a... You don't want to look, but you have to look. Yeah. that's <laughs> what, Yeah, like you just can't help it. Yeah. Ugh. No. But I wonder if that's ever happened. If that's a thing. I bet. Never heard of that one. Like walk in, like someone on the floor. Like they call for help and then they come Some back and they're gone. Dead ghost. Yeah. I mean it's residual. Yeah. But I think the idea with residual well, no, it's probably out of their control. I have no idea. I don't know. So you can you can actually go and rent this place still. They almost shut it down after that dude stabbed himself in there. And I'm Johnny staying there. Hauser was like, no, we need to keep this open. And so, like, we can go stay there. I'm not staying there. Why? Some guy got stabbed. I'm not staying there. <laughs> Eight people got killed in there. It's got bad juju, man. I'm not going in there. <laughs> Don't you want to go try to talk to some ghosts? No. Would you tore it? Yeah, I tore it. Okay. I wouldn't stay in it. I'm not staying in it. Do you want to wake up and, like, see little girls underneath your bed? I mean, it'd be kind of fun. You think so till you <laughs> see it. Sounds like a good time. <laughs> you, just just picture it. Just picture it. Yeah, it would freak me out. Yeah. In a good way, though. No. I don't think, no. I don't think so. Don't you want to experience that? No. <laughs> I want more. I don't want to do it at a house I'm going to stay at. If I'm just torn and I see something, that's fine. I'm not going to stay well, there. You can leave if something happens. 
Where am I going to go? Outside. Go sleep in a truck. I'm not going to sleep in a truck? In the middle of Iowa? Someplace I don't know? I'm going to start driving home. I don't know. <laughs> what if we flew? All the way in Iowa. <laughs> it's a long way from here. Well, you'd probably get a rental car. Drive back to the airport. Or bring a tent. I just, I'm not a tort, but I'm not staying there. Uh, There's a lot of places I won't stay. Party pooper. Freaks me out. I'd give it a whirl. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If I, I wouldn't do it alone. But <laughs> <laughs> if somebody else was there, I'd do it. Well, I'm not going with you. I still think we need to go stay at the Admiral Fell in. The what? Admiral Fell in. No, that's in. <laughs> that's worse. <laughs> That's in Fell's Point. I'd rather stay in the middle of Iowa in a haunted house in the middle of Fell's Point on a good day. Well, it's Fell's Point. You know how that place is. Well, we gotta go somewhere. We gotta stay somewhere. We go to haunted. Gettysburg. How about that? <laughs> Why? It's nice. It's pretty out there. There's trees. Okay, so we'll find a haunted place in Gettysburg. We'll go stay there. A haunted place in Gettysburg. Yeah. Dude, they're everywhere. It's Gettysburg. It's, exactly. We'll find a place to stay and we'll go to stay. I don't know if you can stay anywhere there. I bet you can stay there. What do you mean? They got, like, hotels and stuff. Yeah, but I don't know if they're haunted. I bet some of them are. They got, like, bed and breakfasts and stuff. I mean, they're haunted. Yeah, but I bet some of them are. Like you say, everywhere is haunted there. I don't know. Already looking for a way out. You just don't want to stay anywhere haunted. I don't. It (laughs) freaks me out, man. I don't sleep good as it is. I don't. I don't need anything else waking me up. (laughs) I already got two dogs. They, they haven't been a problem lately. I just I just don't sleep well. And the ghosts, <laughs> knowing that I'm in a haunted house, won't help me sleep. Tundra kind of sounds like a ghost sometimes. Some kind of freaky animal. Well, a freaky animal and a ghost. Yeah, well, it could be. You know, it sounds like a like almost like a banshee. He does make some weird. No- I don't know what's wrong with him. He just makes. He's always made weird noises. I think he's pit bull. That's why. Weird. Tragedy seems to have a way of imprinting energy that sticks to locations like blood stains on hardwood. We can try to cover it up, but when you're in its presence, you can still feel the echoes of the past vibrating the walls around you. When that tragedy happens in what is supposed to be our safe space, the term home sweet home tends to lose its luster. Sometimes it seems those forced to play the victim in that scenario are trapped in that space forever. And if you believe the stories, the past can reach out and grab you. But if you think you can stand it, go try to stay the night at the Velisca Axe murder house. Just make sure to check the attic before going to bed. This concludes tonight's episode of The Black Flame Podcast. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at The Black Flame Podcast. We'll be back in two weeks with more terrifying tales. So until then, stay spooky.